gorgeous ones, hello, hello. As you know, I'm about an hour late tonight after driving right over the other side of the bay to see Dr. Mary. And I've just got home, I had to quickly set up a few things, but I have to cook dinner, so I might as well do it live. And I don't know if anyone's gonna show up, but it doesn't really matter because I'm cooking for myself anyway. So what I'm gonna to cook tonight is just a little variation on a stroganoff. Hello, gorgeous ones. So you remember, remember our formula. Pick a protein, add some veggies, add a bit of fat, add some flavor. Like it couldn't be easier. And as you know, at Real Life Medicine, we are all about prioritizing protein. And why do we wanna do that? Because protein keeps us full, because our body loves protein. Protein is, there's this thing called the thermogenic effect of protein. And what that means is that when we eat whole proteins, so not powders or branch chain amino acids or any of that stuff. But when you eat protein, like, you know, in a hamburger or in some mince or in an egg or a piece of cheese or whatever, it actually takes quite a bit of energy for your body to break that down. So the body's got, you've got to chew it, it makes enzymes, it's got saliva, and you've got to go into your stomach and it's got to mash it and all these little enzymes come in and cleave the proteins into little polypeptides. So proteins are giant strings of peptides and then we go into little ones and then we go into amino acids and then they're sucked up in. Um, yes, Barry, thank you. I did have a good day seeing Mary and I'm going to talk to you guys about her in a few moments. I just want to get cracking on this dinner, then we can chat while it's cooking. So again, real food, real fast, doesn't have to be fancy, doesn't have to be exciting, but it is tasty. And so I like that. I like that, I like ease, as you know. I like the idea of, you love protein, good Nikki, I know you do, you're a big protein girl, it's excellent. So I like to make my life easy, and so I have meals on high repeat. So I'm just gonna cook, a, cook some butter, heat up some butter in my pan over here. Helps if I turn the thing on. Oh, heat. Heat is a good thing to press. Um, I've got my very, you know, <laughs> my famous onions, my not famous onions, but the ease, chop up some onions. You do not have to worry about your eyes crying. They add a bit of flavor. And onions actually have a lot of nutritional properties. So they're a very undervalued um, thing. They're not helpful if you've got FODMAPs, but I'll also tell you but if you've, um, so FODMAPS is a, is a fructose oligosaccharide um, malabsorption problem and causes a lot of pain in our gut from the over fermentation of those sugars um, and it gives people pain. But you don't have to have that. You, you low carb, it, it really fixes it. It's really amazing. And I've seen so many people who have what is called IBS and they've been on a FODMAPS diet and they've been on FODMAPs for years, they lower their carbs and voila, they can suddenly eat onion, garlic, cabbage, broccoli, all the things they thought they couldn't eat. Interestingly, a low FODMAPs diet is supposed to be short term. A lot of people don't realize that. The idea was that you kind of settle everything down and then you reintroduce foods at, until you get a tolerance. And the tolerance, the, the, when you know you've passed your tolerance threshold, it's because you get gas and bloating and pain and all of those things. Now, here's how to make a dinner that is different to what you thought you were gonna make. So I have bought this week, I bought some lamb mince. Now, lamb mince is actually really good. It's pretty cheap. Um, beef mince is pretty dear. Um, yeah, Nikki can eat onions now, wonderful. So beef mince, depending on the quality of your mince, is quite expensive. You don't need to buy the heart smart one with all the fat taken out. You can buy the cheaper one if you want to. That's perfectly fine. I thought I had bought some more mints, but actually I bought burgers. But I, I don't have anything to have with the burgers this week, so I'm actually gonna chop these and put them in as part of my beef and lamb stroganoff. So I'm just waiting for the pan to heat up. I'm just frying my onions. I'm gonna whack this lamb in. Bang. I'm just gonna chop these a bit because I don't wanna have them as whole burgers, but I don't necessarily want them as mince either, so I'm actually just gonna chop them a bit. They may well just um, disintegrate, that's all right. Again, this is the Cleavers brand. I really like that brand because there's nothing else in these. There's, it's basically just hamburger mince. Whenever I say hamburger mince, it reminds me of the Pink Panther. Not the 
original one, the second one, that was in, I think maybe the 90s with Steve Martin, who had this French accent, which is really probably terrible. Um, not like as in, as in a really terrible French accent, but he would always go hamburger. Whenever I say the word hamburger in my head now, it translated into Steve Martin language. Got my, got my wooden spoon here. So Mary, gorgeous ones. I'm just moving over here to um, stir my thingy. Mary is, oh my God, this little baby, so beautiful. Such a beautiful little boy. Um, he slept the whole way. So we, she, we, went to, we met in her town of Anglesey and we had lunch and she brought him in a, in a little pouch and he just snuggled in like a koala and we were able to have um, our lunch. I had a chicken Caesar salad, which was very nice. And I'm actually quite full. So in actual fact, I don't even know if I'll have dinner tonight because by the time we had lunch, it was maybe about two and it had a lot of chicken in it. So I'll see how I go. It, what I'm doing anyway tonight is batch cooking because you know, I like to always have something on the go. If I'm gonna bother cooking, which I do, then I don't want to really have to do it every single night. You can if you want to, but I'm pretty happy as long as I've got something nice. If I've made a big dish of something I don't like, then that becomes a bit tedious. So again, I'm just chopping these little hamburgers up a bit into sort of chunks and I'll just see how they fry up. And I'm doing this on a separate board because I've got some cabbage that I'm gonna cook later as well. Because I kind of figure with a stroganoff, you need a cabbage. Now, if um, I haven't got any sauerkraut left, but if I had some sauerkraut, I would actually fling that in. Right at the end, just stir it through. Like, basically, I would do it a bit like a garnish. So I'd put a big plop of this beef slash lamb stroganoff, and I'd put a big glob of sauerkraut on top. But sadly, I don't have any. So that's going on the shopping list. I don't make my own sauerkraut. You can, obviously. Uh, does anyone else here, anyone else on, make their own sauerkraut? Um, otherwise, there's a, I mean, there's plenty of really good, reputable brands these days. That looks good. So, just so that you know, basically chopped it up, and it's basically the hamburgers is gone into sort of square chunks. All right, I'll let that fry up, get rid of this. I have got some mushrooms. I didn't chop these ones. Sometimes I chop my mushrooms, sometimes I don't. Again, I have a look at my week and I've, I tend to buy some mushrooms whole and some mushrooms chopped and I save the chopped ones for the nights so that I don't have time to chop. Um, but if you don't, you know, you can certainly just chop your own mushrooms or you can just not have any. I've got zucchini. Oh, Susan's made it several times, but you tend to buy it more often. I think it's a little bit, you have to with sauerkraut, from my understanding, you really have to be very careful that you um, have a weight on it and that it all, all of the cabbage stays under the brine because it can, it's, it can get um, either bacteria or mold in it. And so anyway, I just figure out, look, these days like, you can buy really good quality sauerkrauts and I'm happy to do that. So I'm just chopping up some, you know, my, I always like to have a couple of veggies. So remembering, pick your protein, add a few veggies. Above ground veggies are best. Um, so anything that's above ground is better. You know, again, it, depending on your level of insulin resistance, if you're not insulin resistant, so if you've got a family that's metabolically flexible, that's very active, um, then you know they can have some sweet potato or potato. But honestly, for me, I'm not metabolically flexible. I'm very prone to insulin resistance. I'm not active. I cannot process carbs. And, and, and what I mean by carbs is I really mean those very highly starchy carbs because clearly there's carbohydrates in all vegetables. Like this is one of the things that gets my goat up a bit. People will go, oh my God, you're cutting out all your carbs. Uh, no, this is carbs. This, this little, whatever this is called, sweet pepper, capsicum, that's carbs. My mushrooms have got carbs. So you're not removing a whole food group. You're just having low carb. And now people go, do you recommend low carb for everybody? And I'm, I've got to be telling, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm not entirely sure that I do. Because I think we need to learn lessons from when we recommended sweeping 
reforms for all the population. So the sweeping reform was low fat. Everyone should eat low fat was the context. So they swapped out the fat for the sugar and then everybody basically ate high carb. So I actually think that if you are metabolically flexible, which means that you're, you don't have insulin resistance, your woodshed is open, you can fast pretty easily, then you can have some carbs. With the proviso though, that you are then moving. So it's best to have your carbs before movement, which is again, tricky with dinner. So in, you know, as you know, in traditionally in European countries, lunch was the most, you know, their big meal. And then dinner was often a smaller meal. And then in Italy, they have this beautiful phrase called fare in passeggiata, which means I'm going to make a walk. And after dinner, everybody does their fare in passeggiata. And it's part of their culture. And you see people ambling around, this is in Sama in particular, after they've had their meal at home, they go ambling around up and down. Um, whereas, you know, again, I, I don't know, parts of Australia are very, you know, people spend a lot of time in their own homes and not always very social. So I don't think that you can make a stroganoff without cabbage. Well, I know that you can, because you can do it any you like. There's no actual recipe. But in my mind, I think, well, stroganoff is sort of a Russian dish. Cabbage reminds me of Russia. So there we go. We're going to have some cabbage. But I'm not going to put all of this cabbage in. Cabbage is quite big, so I'm just going to chop this here. And I'll put the rest back in for something else. Now, when with the mingle, right? So if you, I don't actually follow their instructions at the back because I find they make their meals too watery. They've always got a lot of stock. Does anyone else find that? So this one, you, you know, it's got 300 mils of stock. Oh, I don't, I don't want, I don't want it super watery because I'm not using rice or anything to soak it up. I like mine to have some sauce, but not be like soup. So I'm not putting any stock in. I'm just going to put that in. Now you know what I might even do? I might even grab another one because I've got a key. I've got a kilo and a half of, of mint. So I'm luckily my cupboard is just here. And I'm actually going to use a little bit of passata. So lots of, uh, oh, here's another stroganoff. So I'm just going to put that in. So basically, I'm just going to fling in these veggies. So this one's actually got five vegetables it's got uh, onions, capsicum, zucchini, mushrooms, and cabbage. So, you know, again, I know that there are people out there who love carnivore and there are people out there for whom carnivore works extremely well. There are people out there who are vegan and for them vegan works extremely well. Neither of those are my preference, but you can certainly work. You can, as long as your diet is real food, then both of them can have benefits. I'm way more worried about the processed plant movement that is going on. Because that, my friends, you don't add stock either. Yeah, too watery, Alison. Yeah, I know. I should feed that back to them, actually. That there's, By the time, particularly with their curry ones, by the time you add the stock and the coconut cream and the blah, 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 just, you don't need all that. But as I said, I don't serve it with rice. So maybe if you're a rice person, you like a bit of extra fluid. All right, so that is my mince. So now, I'm just going to shovel in my vegetables. I have to still chop my cabbage. And I'm going to throw in these mushrooms. Then I've got time to talk to you lovelies about a couple of other things that have been on my mind. So. It's really, I mean, again, I'm not interested in diet wars. I'm not interested in, you know, what diet is best. You know that we've done a podcast and we do know that there is no universal best diet. I'm mindful of, it, of um, public health measures that recommend something for all the population. 
because I see what has happened with low fat being recommended for everyone. I see what has happened with low salt being recommended for everyone. And I think that we need to be really mindful of recognising that there is individual nutrition at play here. But I think what we can all agree on is that unprocessed food really is really the, the crux of health, unprocessed food. So, you know, I'm very, very worried about things like the, you know, the, the whatever it's called, not quite meat, not quite chicken, I can't believe it's not chicken, all of that. I can't believe, I can't believe it's not chicken. I can't believe people buy it. That's what I can't believe. So, does anyone else ever do that? Open up their tomato cart paste and go to the... Normally, my trick for this is storing it upside down, but I suspect somebody has been writing through my fridge and not done that, which is fine. I'll just put this in instead. So I'll probably, for this one, just put, I reckon, about half, half a jar in. Remember, I don't want it too saucy because I'm going to be putting some sour cream through. So then, I just put the lid on. Now, while that's cooking, right, while that's cooking, I get to talk to you. I could equally, if I wanted to, you know, clean up the kitchen and then by the time it's finished, voila, clean kitchen, put all the things in the recycling, put the fed, you know, leftover veggies away. Or this is another thing that you can do because you know we're all about strength training. Now, sadly for me, that's not such a great option, but you can certainly do your squats <laughs> at, the ki at the kitchen bench. Time in 10 squats every time you chop a vegetable and by the end of your of your cooking, you will have done 100 squats or something like that. Timing a little, because what happens, right? We go, oh, if I'm gonna do exercise, I've gotta get dressed and I've gotta put on my shoes and I've gotta put in my exercise gear and I've gotta get my music out and then I've gotta get going and I haven't got time for that. So you do nothing. Good, a lot doing giving me a thumbs up or a you know, strong man. So you don't have to do it like that. You can do little patches throughout the day whenever you're standing, you know, standing around. So you could be doing toe raises and just be up and down on your toes. You can certainly, as you know, my favorite sit to stand. So if you even, and even if, you know, say, say someone like me or anybody who's a bit older or anyone who's got some mobility things, I could put a chair behind me and I could literally sit down on the chair and get back up. And I could do that, I don't know, 20 times while I'm cooking, do it, dinner. I could certainly do it 10 times while I'm waiting for my coffee thingy, my contraption over here to do its magic. So in the morning it has to heat up, I often stand there watching it. I think, oh, I should actually be doing something while I'm standing there watching it. When I press the button for the coffee to thing, it actually takes 30 seconds. In 30 seconds, I could have probably done 10 squats. So I think the idea is that you doesn't have to be dedicated, you know, half an hour or 45 minute blocks because that makes our brain go, oh, I don't have time for that. It's a little bit hard. Good, Dee's just written that she's accidentally put T2 instead of two T, two something, right? Two tablespoons or two into her, <laughs> oh, she's watching me squat. <laughs> so yeah, I think that, um, you know, we don't have to, it, nothing has to be perfect, but what it does need to do is have consistency. So you don't have to do something every day, but doing it most days. You don't have to go 100%, but if you go 80% then that, and you do that most days, then it'll be fine. It's a bit like sleeping. If you have one late night every now and then, well, you know, that doesn't matter. But if you consistently have late nights, which is a potential thing for me, I have to be really mindful of that. I know that you know that. But I have to really be mindful of what my brain is doing because it sits there and then it gets, it's a bit like it goes past this point of reason and then I'm just glued to the screen of some bullshit Netflix thing I'm not really even interested in. One of the things that has been, oh, you put in tablespoons of curry instead of teaspoons. I'm sure it'll be delicious, Dee, because I really love a strong curry. Um, I think that, uh, oh, Nikki's favorite squats is doing it uh, on an oscillating platform while you're waiting for your food to cook. Ooh, what's an oscillating platform? Is that like, um, is that like one of those things where you go around and like that? Um, I also know that people will do squats while they're doing brushing teeth because you're doing 10 minutes. Again, it can be squats. Squats are great because they do these big muscles and these are the biggest muscles. We want to get bang for our buck. You can also do calf raises. You can also even do some push-up-y things. Um, again, main thing you've got to watch when you're doing press-ups is that you watch your form so that you bring, draw your belly button back 
like a bit like it's going through your back here, pulling yourself. And then I have this imagination that they're, you know, a bit like, <laughs> does anyone remember, um, uh, you know, the dolls, the baby Chrissy, uh, Chrissy and Cinnamon and some other doll, and you would pull their hair and then anyway, or they had a button. So anyway, whatever. I've got the button in my back that's holding my tummy in and keeping my form and then and you, you can and you don't even have to start out very far you can just start out a little bit from the bench and just go like that and that you'll feel it and then you can take your legs out a bit further and you can just do that while you're standing around instead we often just what we often do is we'll stand at a kitchen bench and you can't see my hips at the moment but I'm standing like resting one hip a bit like a horse that's really bad for us I do it all the time and I have to be really mindful. I watch one of my daughters does it all the time, the other one doesn't. So it's not good for our posture to be really resting like that. We need to be really, the idea is standing nice and tall, bringing those, turning on those abdominals. And just, you know, when you're standing, if you imagine that you're, um, you've got like a string through you up to the sky and the way I imagine my tummy muscles to go in is like when you're walking into a pool and you get that bit where you go oh, that's it <gasps> okay so that's uh, that's how you do your so you can just do those while you're standing around doing nothing it's awesome so you don't have to have a formal um, I'm off to do exercise now plan because sometimes that can be a little bit boring okay so now I'm just giving this a bit of a stir this is looking good it does look, it looks, it's massive. So this is gonna do us for a little while. I'm just gonna stir it in for a bit longer. Again, you get a lot of juice, if you like, from the cabbage and actually quite a bit from the mince. This is why I don't wanna add a lot more. Um, I think I forgot to add in my favorite new salt, Australian Lake salt from somewhere in Western Australia, Ancient Lakes it's called. It's quite a fine salt. And I'll just put a couple of sprinkles because again, it's a massive, massive plate. Now, I know that some of our ladies doing in momentum, in momentum, we are doing the nighttime eating challenge, which is also a course that people can buy if they want to. Um, it's and it's not nighttime eating; it's actually how to stop after dinner snacking is really what it is. Ah, oh, okay. You've got a. It's a, one of those strength strengthening. Um, Vibration plates, Nikki, is what you're going to take. I'm going to look into those. Um, so one of the jobs for the girls or the women to do in Momentum and anyone else who's bought the nighttime, how to stop nighttime eating course, is a protein audit. It's actually, it's actually really hard to hit your protein macro if you're not focused on it. So I know the people um, who, are, who are more keto raw or who really focus a lot on meat, they, they probably don't have any trouble. But for a lot of other people, they do. And part of that is, this is part of my thing about the yogurt and berries where people have that for breakfast. It's like, oh, a whole meal there where you've probably got seven grams of protein. And again, remembering, in fact, I'm gonna do a quiz. Who knows how much protein we should be eating per day, roughly. First one to write in is the winner. I'm not even gonna, I'm gonna wait. It's tempting for me just to blurt out the answer. I was one of those kids at school that would just blurt out the answer. It's, it's probably so annoying. Um, I'll wait for you to come on. And somebody I know, I know you know it. Um, so yes, that's really what I'm uh, focusing on. Six, I could have read that. Six years, it looks like 60 OJR. Ah, there we go. Alani's the winner. One gram per kilo of body weight. And Nikki, one gram per kilo. Exactly. It's actually a lot. It is a lot. One gram per kilo. Correct. Correct, correct. Oh, good. You've all been listening. Hooray. Hooray. One gram per kilo of body weight. And that's for the day divided into your meals. Again, you may not hit that every day, but if you hit it most days, and it's a minimum. Because remembering it's pretty hard to overeat protein. So it's a minimum. If you eat more than that, that's okay. But you really need to be trying to get that. So if you weigh 60 kilos, you need 60 grams a day. If you weigh 100 kilos, you need 100 grams a day. Remembering that steak, if it's lean steak, 
it's probably got 25 grams of protein per 100. But if it's, if it's a fattier cut or a mince, then it's probably only got 20 grams. So, you know, if you're trying to hit a 70 gram macro, it's, it's a decent amount of food. I think people are quite surprised. Um, and it also indicates to me that a lot of, particularly women, under eat. I know it sounds weird, because you're going, well, you know, I'm fat, I must have eaten. No, no. It's not the amount of food that you eat, it's the nutrition of what you eat. So prioritizing your protein. Now, I loved today, um, and I don't know if you're watching Maria, but I loved it. She popped in, her, in our group about this morning's chat I did. And this morning's chat has been the theme for the last couple of weeks, which is you're coming up with your most useful belief. And the idea is that our brain, our brain listens to what we say. And if we are telling ourselves something is hard, then it's gonna be hard. And the reason it is hard is we have this thing. Remember, raw versus cooked weight, Jackie, it's the raw weight of meat is what I'm measuring. So the raw, raw meat, it's 100 grams of raw meat, it's 100 grams of raw chicken, and that has somewhere between 20 and 25 grams depending on how much fat it is. If it's lean, it's gonna have a bit more protein. If it's fatty, it's gonna have a bit less. That's kind of, and again, it's rough. You don't need to know exactly, but I know that I've got a kilo and a half of mince in here. This I reckon will do my husband and I probably three nights, so six meals, which basically means we're probably having 300 grams of meat each, which suits me, because that means I've got my protein requirement for the day in that one meal, 75 grams. I'll probably have a little bit more because I had lunch today, but I'm actually thinking about it now, because I had a big lunch, I probably won't have that much tonight. But normally I don't have much, you know, I have a, quite a, a smallish lunch. Um, so you, you know, you need to be mindful. It, this business of a, a palm sized piece of meat, yeah, that's probably not gonna cut it. That's only often about 75 grams. It's just not gonna cut it. Um, so yeah, so, the, so back to our brain. Uh, and I also wanna just make note today, I haven't even spoken about this in our socials yet. It is clearly, um, it is diabetes week. Um, Diabetes Awareness Week, and it is really important for us to be talking about that because diabetes is a global, global, whole body condition. You don't just have a touch of it, and you don't just suddenly get it. It's leading up to it, so you will have, and this is this is what we really need to be mindful of because people, when they are diagnosed, often already have complications. And that's because the complications to start before the diagnosis. Pre-diabetes is as serious as diabetes. They're the same disease. It's just that one's early in the disease and one's later. So if someone says to you, I've got, oh, I've got a touch of sugar, that's the old fashioned thing. Just got a touch of sugar. Um, or if they go on pre-diabetic, you, you're diabetic. You just, it's the same condition. Um, what it means though, in, ooh, ooh, can you see all this steam? And this is why I don't put sauce, any more sauce into my thing because it's now quite watery. So I'll just leave that off. That's actually done. And all I now need to do is spoon a few spoonfuls of this lovely sour cream in it. This is a, hmm, this is a Woolies brand. Yuck to diabetes. Well, I think the thing is that we just need to know that you know the whole issue, the whole issue with diabetes is it is a disease that it, that affects every organ in our body, and so every organ bears the brunt because glucose, glucose is toxic. Gluc too, you know, glucose, a little bit of glucose is good, you know, too much is 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 less than good, and in fact, really really toxic. So you know, my useful belief for this, as you know, I really believe that glucose is harmful, and I have a whole list of reasons why. And glucose is not just sweet sugar, savory flour, that's just glucose. So sugar is glucose plus a fructose molecule, and fructose has its own issues. Glucose plus glucose is starch, so chains of glucose together is starch, and that starch is rice, potato, flour, obviously pasta, all of those things, they're just glucose. So bread, 
is just the same as glucose jelly beans. Just the same. Has the same physiological effect. So anyway, I'm just whacking in. It's probably, I'd say, a quarter of a cup of this, 100 mils of this stuff. So sour cream, and again, look at your, learn to read your labels quickly. You don't have to be madly um, um, logging everything. Similar ratio for fats and carbs. Leslie, I'm a big fan of lower, lower carbs. No, so definitely not a milligram per kilo for carbs. And again, I am a fan of the, it depends on how insulin resistant you are and how sugar addicted you are. So I personally like to try and keep my carbs at around about 30 a day. It's, it's, it's easy with, with just eating vegetables. If I ate a biscuit, that would blow the wet, that out of the water. Um, and, and fat, again, the fat macro is always tricky. And this is why I don't like the calculators. When you're first starting your low carb journey, if you are insulin resistant, your woodshed will be shut. And if you don't know what your woodshed is, go to our website, rlmedicine.com, and you will see a blog called The Woodshed. Just search in woodshed. And it basically tells you the woodshed is what I refer to our fat stores. So let's say here's my woodshed. And if I have insulin, high circulating insulin, it's like a padlock on my woodshed. So I need to get fuel, because that's what fat is, it's fuel, and I can't get it from my woodshed because it's shut. So therefore, at the start, I have to eat it, and that's okay. At the start, you eat a whole lot more than when your woodshed is open. Once your woodshed is open, your body can access its own stored fat and burn it. And isn't that what we all want? We want to be metabolically well, burning our stored fat. Storing it for a rainy day with 10 padlocks on it is unhelpful, useless. Having access to your fat stores means that you can, that's what we call fat adapted, and you can then access them whenever you want. And so if you miss a meal, your body doesn't care. It goes, oh, I'll just go and grab a log out of my woodshed. But you can't do that if you're insulin resistant and your woodshed is shut. So this is why we bang on about keeping your carbs low. That will open your woodshed. So yeah, so and my formula, again, the start I go always one gram. The protein doesn't change because we can't store protein. So protein is always one milligram per kilo of your current body weight. As you lose your weight, you can have less protein. It's weird, but that's it. And look, there's lots of other formulas. There are people that do 0.8 per lean body mass, but it's very hard to calculate your lean body mass, very hard. So I just thought, you know, it's a rule of thumb. So again, it doesn't have to be perfect. If you weigh 90 kilos and you get 80 grams of protein, that's all right. If you weigh 90 kilos and you have 120 one day, that's all right. If you weigh 90 kilos and you, every day for six months, you have 60 grams of protein, that's not all right. Your body's not gonna be happy with you. It will make you hungry. It will do sorts, sorts of things. So, and if you're bodybuilding, if you're, you know, training for the Commonwealth Games, you're going to be having a lot more than that because your body is actually growing muscle and that, that requires all of, your, um, all of your protein. Now, while I'm on the thing of protein, um, I saw a post recently and people were asking about a supplement or a protein powder called Tasteless Protein. It's actually pretty good if you're if you can't eat food, real food for, a, for some sort of reason. If you can eat real food, I mean, I'd rather have my protein from a piece of steak than a bunch of powder, honestly. But if you've had bariatric surgery or you're taking a Zempic and, it, that, and it's hard to eat that quantity of food, then you can have something called tasteless protein. But the thing is, it's not a complete protein, it's collagen. And collagen is missing an essential amino acid called tryptophan. Tryptophan, just turning this out. Tryptophan is uh, really important. It is one of our precursors to a whole heap of our like neurotransmitters. So we definitely need to eat tryptophan. You can't, your body cannot recycle it from anywhere. It's called an essential amino acid, which means you essential, it's essential that you eat it. So you won't get that from your tasteless protein. So you need to eat it and it's found in Weirdly, it's found in milk, and that's what—that's the thing that makes us a bit sleepy. Um, but it's also found in eggs. It's found in fish. 
So, you know, tuna and eggs, plenty of tryptophan. So again, just be mindful when you're having things, you need to kind of have a little bit of knowledge. You don't need to become a, you know, a dietitian, a nutritionist, or any of that sort of stuff. But a little bit of knowledge is really helpful so that you know you're doing all the right things, which is why it all comes back to the basics of making sure you eat as much as possible real food because then you have all the things that you need beautifully. All right, darlings, that's dinner cooked. I'm gonna pop it in a plate and stick a photo up for you later. Uh, 7.30, so how was that? That, like, seriously, I got home in the door at five to seven. I've had time to work up the screen, have a yak, talk about low carb, chat about protein, have a lovely time. All right, beautiful people, I'll see you all next Tuesday at six, and I'll see you tomorrow morning at eight. And uh, if you're struggling with nighttime eating, don't forget we have a course, it's a mini course from Special, 47 bucks. Lots and lots of information and lots of things to really keep your mind in the game because nighttime eating is usually a physiological problem, uh, sorry, a psychological problem, not a physiological problem. Most of you know that, but anyway. See you tomorrow. Bye darlings.